there's a um, oh we're, we're live we're live yeah we're live but you know yeah when are we not live all right let's talk about our right, first one day before thanksgiving uh two days before my 37th birthday my birthday is always around thanksgiving um I guess just to give a, a quick where we are one day before Thanksgiving, holiday season is, is upon us. It is really cold outside and it gets dark like at 5 p.m. now. Um, so we're right in the right in the thick of uh, of the winter. Um, not entirely sure what topics we're going to talk about today. Uh, we are two weeks back from our spiritual retreat, uh, Stephen and I, and we are we are re reintegrating. And I think at some point in the podcast, I would probably touch on what Steven to see how his reintegration process is going since we haven't spoken about that recently between the two of us. Uh, but aside from that, um, I don't know, Steven, what's going on with you, man? Uh, as I mentioned to you, literally just before we got on the podcast, I've been will focus very much on on integration uh very much so uh i think that's the prevailing theme and not to be too ridiculous about it but as of yesterday i was playing with the idea of uh changing my name uh to my middle name uh and and seeing how that would go and it's not a it's not a wholly original idea uh as of late, like I've, I've definitely thought of it before, but I think as part of integration, it's caused me to do such deep reflection. And obviously front and center of that is for us often is what is ego and identity. Uh, and then so this idea of changing my name kind of came back up as, a, as an entertaining uh, thought experiment that may or may not manifest, we'll have to see. But I think if you're listening to this, maybe think about that today. What, what would it be like if I just suddenly changed my name? And what would it mean? What are the feelings that come up when I think about potential names or the name that I'm leaving? I don't know. It's quite interesting. So. I have a lot of thoughts around uh, changing one's name, but I'm actually curious why. Uh, how, did, how did you spur that um, I guess that motivation or like what's motivating you to be like, Hey, I might want to change my name. And what are your thoughts around a name? What does it mean to you? What does the name Steven mean to you? The name that your parents gave you um, this uh, I guess like this construct you've been carrying around your entire life and why would you change it? Um, it's crazy, isn't it? It gave me chills even as you were posing that question to me, just because even as I think, familiar and versed as we can be in <laughs> constructs and identity i think name is still is still such an interesting one right either you i mean some people hate their name for that we spoken a little bit about that too but um so i guess to start off this story uh i remember maybe in my teens asking my dad like where the heck did my does my name come from um and it turns out that he named me after one of his former colleagues. Uh, my dad worked uh, in the Navy, and so he worked with this uh, architects, architects slash, slash engineer who basically had like near photographic memory of like, you know, he would like memorize ship blueprints and know exactly like what the infrastructure was for like this one cell of the ship of a Navy ship or something. And so my dad always said, yeah, he's the smartest guy I ever met. Um, and so that's why I named you after. And <laughs> Um, which, uh, <laughs> so that's an interesting one. And then just because I think Steven too, I've been reflecting on it. There's like different spellings of Steven. It's not a particularly popular name, at least in my circles nowadays. Uh, it's also, I'll just go out and say it, it's also very white, <laughs> you know, Steven. And then, so that's my, I guess that's my birth name, official name, government name. And then uh, where I'm at on this was um, 
in 2014, I went backpacking, backpacking in Vietnam for the first time. And it was extremely profound and, and, and touching, right? Um, to go back to, you know, the place, uh, like our motherland, basically, as, as uh, first generation immigrants. And yeah, I was so touched, but moved by it that when I came back, I went onto Facebook and I immediately updated it so that my middle name was in there. My middle name is Vietnamese, it's Bao, right? And so instead of just Stephen Nguyen, it, my tag on Facebook says Stephen Bao Nguyen. Um, and for me, that was a big signal, right? And a big signal, not, not, not just whoever sees my name, but like to myself, like I would always see it. That was part of my identity, adding that back in. And then I think as of late, where our spiritual journey has taken us, up till now, I've always tr tried to explore more of the middle way. And, you know, what are some of the small things you can do to renew, revitalize, to cast away the ego, to experience non-attachment? Maybe experiencing non-attachment by virtue of detachment, right? Um, that, you know, isn't like immediately jumping off a cliff, just like small little things. And so I thought the name, like, I, you know, like I've randomly deleted things at times that caused, like, I was like, oh my God, this, shoot, the thought of deleting this whole record. Like I, one day I deleted my whole Reddit comment history for like the past like eight years. Um, and like, I was like, why am I attached to this? Holy crap. Like I'm really attached to this. Like, I don't want to delete this. Therefore I got to delete it. So, I'm gonna, so I deleted it. And then so I think the name falls in a similar purview of like, oh shoot, changing my name. Like my dad gave me this name. He, you know, he also, by the way, Kim and I, my sister, Kim and I, we recently revisited this conversation and we ended up finding our, um, our namesake, like the people that we were named, she was named Kimberly. So same, same story, similar story. And my guy, we found his obituary and that was, quite interesting to read um whereas my sister we found her person on linkedin um you know she yeah, it's just i don't know i'll kind of just stop that rant there but okay so um there's a lot of jumping off points here yeah. i could, I could go back messy I yeah. go back towards the name thing, but I also wanted to. Um, I also want to ask you why the fuck would you delete your your whole Reddit comment history? I mean, you kind of touched on it, <laughs> um, but uh, but we'll leave that one there for a little bit. Um, I guess I don't know my thoughts on a name. I would I would never think to change my name, uh, but I've also been given a much different name than 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 you based on where we grew grew up you know, you said your name is white. I mean, I, I know white people named Steven. So, um, I mean, that's probably true. I don't know anyone named Hack. And uh, I believe we have talked on a previous episode of this podcast about white, what type of name you have and growing up. I, uh, I had a, my experience growing up was obviously when kids see a name and it's not common, then you have to you kind of have to like grow into your name in a way you you almost have to like tank a bunch of bullshit growing up you know people would be like why would your parents name you hack and then they start making like i don't know like fucking coughing noises and stuff and i'm like this is very original buddy i've heard that one since i was in second grade um and then so over time uh through hating my name and being because I had to like kind of defend it or at least like be able to uh, grow thicker skin around it uh, to being like, you know what, uh, it doesn't matter that much. And also, as you get older, people start to become a little more mature and they don't make fun of your name because it's obviously like kind of lame. Uh, I don't know. I, I've earned like I feel like I've earned like this, this this three letter name my parents gave me. And I'm sure when my parents gave me the name. I know my parents put a lot of thought into it. Uh, my mom's a writer and she named all of us after birds and i'm there was one point in my life where i was like yo why don't you just give me like why don't you just name me steven <laughs> you know like what the fuck um but that was probably 
uh, closer to like, you know, elementary school, going into middle school around that time when it was more of an issue. Um, man, I can't imagine changing my name. Like if I was like, hey, I'm just, what's up guys? It's me, John. How's it going? <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I guess life would hit different if you if you change your name. Uh, and then like in the future, like naming your kids and stuff. I know a lot of our friends have kids now. Uh, and going through the naming process, like the kids aren't going to... Like when I see like Owen and Lisa picking off names for their kids, Leo and Liana, and then like the next one, and they're trying to like stick with like a certain theme, and um, I don't know. And then and then like and then when when you learn the like, hey, what's this kid's name? Oh, it's Leo, and you're like, oh, it's Leo, and then it's like such like this magical thing. It's like a someone's name is like a like a magical spell. It's like you can cast a spell on somebody by using their name. Like now when I'm like Leo, that dude literally just comes running and it's just decibels coming out of my mouth. And he's like, hi, hack. <laughs> and so it's like, a, it, it, it's like this magical spell. And, and to, to be under that spell for, for decades and then, and then try to change your name. Uh, that would be pretty, that would be a very interesting, uh, I don't know how long it takes to change someone's name in terms of like, you know, people stop calling you Steven and people start calling you by your new name and then you getting used to it. And then I wonder if you ever stop responding to Steven. You hear someone say Steven, you're like, oh, wait, never mind. That's not me. Yeah, right. Or that's the old me. Or I, I distantly remember that. Uh, it's like a dream now, the time when I was Steven um yeah and, and again not to get too esoteric about it but the i think in the manner that i wish i kind of just said that the tone and tenor of it is kind of like the playfulness or whimsy that i've been using to be in to, to practice integration and protect practice being in spirit right like um you know bring i think bringing meditation actively into like all the waking moments of your life i think a part of it is it's phrasing things in an observational way, like, oh, oh, interesting. Like, uh, that person's angry, you know? Oh, look, oh, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm offended. I feel like, you know, like, and just like, and so the name thing, I think is the same way. I would constantly just like, oh, that's, that's interesting. That's Steven, that, you know? But I, I think that you, I think for, for precisely the reasons that you mentioned is why it's super intriguing to me because it, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be easy, right? <laughs> I, you know, I, I even started game playing in my house. Like, hey, you know what? Like, I don't need to change it at my current job. Like, that's too much of a mess, especially since it's like, yeah. yeah the contract of Steven at my current corporate company, like the biggest company I've worked for, like I work on a team of like 300 people. It's like, don't need to best for that one, especially <laughs> when everything Zoom calls. Probably with my friends, like that space start and, you know, they'll respect it and i'll just like see how it goes um but with new people i yeah that'd be the interesting thing yeah say straight up yeah there's there's so much to names man i uh, one thing i was actually talking about when we were back in austin for our ceremony i was talking to uh, aaron about it um you know uh because one of the i downloads i had was like if i were to have kids what my future kids names would be and something I had talked with my girlfriend with before, but um, I'm kind of 50, 50 split. I kind of told her on a, as an aside, just kind of like push the envelope. I was like, you know, wouldn't it be cool? Wouldn't it be cool if like society as a cultural norm, we just like named our kids after we knew, got to know them a little bit, you know, instead of giving them a name, like what if like we were just totally cool with like letting the kid hit their first year and then they get their name. Um, you know, and I'm just musing and then she is like, yeah, but at the same time, like there's something that like being had, being given a name and then having to grow into it. Right. And I was like, yeah, you're right. Like totally. Like both of them are, are have their own merits. And yeah, I think I'm 50, 50 on that. It, I think it's cool either way. 
but I think it was, I think it'd be cool if it was more 50, 50 and less 100, zero um, in naming customs. But what would, what would happen if you just didn't give someone a name? Yeah. At some, at some point, somebody has to uh, name them, right? What's crazy. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, I haven't touched child psychology or formative psychology for a while, but like, let's say a year, you spend a year not with your kid, not having a name, but you would still have to be like, Hey, 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 little guy. Hey, you like, you know what I mean? Um, His name would what, just be little guy. Yeah. Hey champ. Like what's the, what's, what's happening when he's like, Oh man, there's not this same sound that, that phonetic that keeps like, I can attach things to. Right. Like, oh, every time my mom, like, say, says these, like, you know, mumbles these, like, syllables, <laughs> I feel better. I know something good is going to happen. Would you even be able, like, I mean, if you don't give them, an, like, a, a proper name, you would still be using some sort of sound to refer to them. So that something. would be their name. That would be their name. Because <laughs> we call uh, Liana Baby. Because she was uh, like, she was like. In reference to, I guess we call her baby before we called her Liana, you know, because we were, we would tell Leo, hey, baby is crying or something. You mean literally English? Where yeah, baby literally. Or Vietnamese yeah. Bear? Okay. No, no, just, just baby. And, okay. and uh, she refers to herself as baby as well uh, as uh, Liana, I'm trying to break her out of the baby thing. But, um, but yeah, so like, I don't know if you can go and go with not naming somebody unless you just never refer to them. That'd be weird though. So I mean, it's, it's extremely profound. Like the statement you just made though, right? Because you're, you're delaying the onset or you're creating friction for the onset of, of like the identification of, the ego, <laughs> like me versus you. The first time you realize me versus you. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I guess it would still form in a lot of different ways. It wouldn't be a label attached to it, but you know, like parents, you know, mom will be like, no, no, don't do that. Oh, you're so, you know, that's so messy. Oh, messy, you know, oh, that's rude. Like, and you start to, you, I mean, you have to take messy and rude and you have to attach them. To, oh, am I met? Like, Am I, you know, clumsy was one that happened to me. Like I was, cause I was a very clumsy kid. And like, but maybe, maybe they would just pick a different. Yeah, you're right. Like baby, like Liana picked up on baby. Maybe kids would just pick up on something. It's whatever sound is used to reference them. Sound is like the easiest thing. Um, or the first sound is sound is probably the first like construct or like i mean obviously they don't use language first in terms of like writing mm -hmm. but language is developed through sound first yeah and especially because um in their formative years you're basically labeling everything for them um you know i was watching this youtube about how i mean we forget by the way that we are like fundamentally anthropomorphically inclined. And so that's a big SAT word, but that's just to say that like, uh, even though we see inanimate objects and forces around us, like we still personalize them. Like we still imbue them with like human qualities. Um, and so when you see like kids programming and challenges, right? Like the world isn't just the world to kids. Like the sun has like a face, like the sun has a smiley face, you know, like, like the cup, even the cup is like a little thing. Like, so the, the world is made up of like, it's actually quite trippy if you think about it, like all these like little spirits. <laughs> um, and that's how we teach kids like what things are and what things are representative is that there's like, they're all alive, right? Um, Thomas the Tank Engine, goodness, he's a train that has this creepy looking face on it, but whatever. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Hmm. Can, is so we're talking about language like those are like uh, constructs made out of like words language um, you know is there are there like 
like the idea of like a visual construct um like with no words but like when i look in the mirror and i see myself even without words i'm like oh that's that's hack that's me and so anytime i see some like you know myself in a picture in a mirror that's like a visual construct if somebody didn't give you a name would you have visual constructs Is that even a thing? I think there's some there's something there, but I think it's so inextricably linked to uh, verbal constructs that it's hard to say. I th I think that like for sure, I think color invokes very different emotions in me. For example, right and biases. Um. But to the degree that they just, they came from my base language and culture, right? Versus like a visual construct. But then again, you know, there's things like blood is red. And so there's still a source that's universal, regardless of what society overlaid onto it, right? Like waters and sky is blue, like leaves are green. Um, so I don't know if that's what you were getting at. But that's kind of the way I interpreted the question. I don't know if that was what you're getting at or not. Like visual constructs of the self? Hmm. Gotcha. Like when you the look image in the of mirror, you. Yeah, when you look in the mirror and you see Stephen, or I guess not Stephen, but say ignore the sound Stephen, but you see like this, this like uh, meat, meat body. Uh, with like you know tattoos and stuff on your arms and everything the way you do your hair and you're like I don't know that's that visual thing that's me yes I would say yes almost certainly my favorite phrase answer right uh, I think when people get old for example and that's when all of a sudden like you know you've been in this body the whole time you, you know, haven't gone anywhere. But for some reason, sometimes people wake up, midlife crisis is a name for a reason, like 45, 50 something. And they're just like, holy crap, I'm old. Look at, look at my ring, look at my hair. Oh my, when did this happen? I'm wrinkly. Like, oh, like the visual construct all of a sudden was like, uh, you know, and then people, you know, go do crazy things to bring themselves back into some sort of like alignment. So I would say almost certainly yes, based on your question. I've been playing around with the idea of um, we've, we've spoken about this before. Uh, I think coming back from Aya and I was saying changing the environment, but then like to me, like environment might even be like changing like the way one looks uh, you know, in terms of like dressing up more. I mean, I've never really cared about dressing up, like uh, putting a lot of thought into my outward appearance beyond, I would say some sort of, I would barely even call it an 80-20, but let's call it an 80-20. Um, so I was wondering what that would look like if I was more intentional with my outward appearance because that gets reflected back onto you based on how people treat you. Because that's an environment that I'm providing. Like when my outward facing self to the world, it gets reflected back onto me based on how people treat me. And then that is almost like a, some sort of a feedback loop. Uh, maybe it can be a positively reinforcing one, or maybe it could just, if that if that becomes like a runaway train situation, you could just become like super vain as well. So I've been kind of thinking about how much effort is the proper proper effort into putting into your outward appearance. Uh, I'm often really late to stuff, so I literally don't have time to do anything aside from throw on some jeans and like pick a shirt off the ground that has it you know that that smell test yes yeah, i'll <laughs> test that joint and then just throw it on and just run out the door but you know what would it mean to like spend 
be more proactive and spend, you know, an extra 10 or 15 minutes uh, each day. Just, I don't know, being intentional with that, uh, deciding, hey, I'm going to wear this because, or I'm going to wear that because, or this looks good. I, I, I want to present myself in this manner. So that's something that I've been, I've been playing around with in my, in my own personal, uh, in my own head. Yeah, um, that's that's great. I, I really love the way that you phrased that. Um, and it, it kind of re-inspired me to pick up pick up this line of thinking too. Now, I mean, I think you brought up 80-20. It's, it's worth defining because it's a concept we use a lot colloquially in our conversation. Um, what's the TLDR for, for 80-20? It's just like, what is the... It's like low hanging fruit. The, the point of maximum ROI, right? I right. Guess, I guess what you would say, like invest you the that when you're trying to invest something that that first that first trigger of maximum ROI, everything thereafter is diminishing returns. Maybe not a steep drop off, but like it starts to like. So it's like, what's the lowest effort you have to do to get the maximal gains? Yeah. Um. So twenty percent of your effort theoretically gives you eighty percent of your gains. Yeah. And then as you go any higher then there's like a relatively steeper drop off as you try to get that from 80 to 85% or to 90% or whatever the case may be. I think there's a flaw in the way that we've been using it that never occurred to me until you said it just now, which is the other part of the, um, the law, which says that it's the last 20 that represents the 80, not the first 20. The you first- catch my drift? It's both, right? No, no, I, not that. Not the way I understand it. The way I understand the the law is that it's the re, the very last twenty percent that represents eighty percent of the work. Or I mean, it's both, isn't it? Yeah. The first the first twenty percent of work gives you eighty percent of the gain. So the corollary of that is the next eighty percent of work will only give you the last twenty percent. Twenty percent. Uh, okay. Okay. Okay, I see what you mean. Right. So, I mean, it, it, you're right, but yeah, yeah. in a manner where it's like also both. So, it's almost like I want to cut it off right at 80%. So, I'm not giving any extra work. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Anyway, back to um, what we were saying. Oh, like kind of. <clears throat> yeah. So, let, let's just get this out of the way, right? There's there's a bad side to everything. They obviously, take into extreme. There's some things that you make you more susceptible than others to ego traps. Um, but I think that for you and I, and probably for a good portion of our friend group, like direct friend group, we're not overly um, invested in aesthetic, like, uh, right, like in in personal, like going far on personal aesthetic, but there, there is something really, I think, to be said there, where I think, and you referenced, like, by your personal assessment, you might not exactly get the age 20 yet, right, so let's say you got to the age 20, but what about the 8119, right? Or the, like, because there's a part of what this whole thing that we're talking about that I've been very focused on, which is uh, how do we shift from non-self and non-attachment, right? Like living freely and, and not too engrossed in, in um, you know, trappings of identity and, and status and whatever and labels yet also be able to be an artist right someone who manifests right like and and like create something and so i've heard it that for a lot of people who are very much into fashion they're like you know how people there's people who like to paint and there's people who like to like play music whatever but for them this is a canvas right? Uh, and art to me fundamentally is all, all about curating some type of experience that can be shared and can invoke different, like, you know, affectation. So to your point, like there's the 80, 20, but then there's also like, now I can start to play with it as a way of expressing or exploring my own creativity, right. In this space, like, 
Like, what if I combine these two colors? Oh, that's, and then I go around and I like A-B test it, right? It's like, oh man, like, let's see how it changed. Um, and that's more than just like functionally looking at it almost. It's more, it's like live art in a, in a sense. I don't know that, I don't know if you catch my drift there or if that made sense, it was a bit of a ramble, but there's like art, you know, like what is art? when we talk about non-self and non-attachment and not falling into traps, but then what is, what is art relative to that? Relative to the self, relative to the ego, you know? So you're saying art is, uh, you said art is curating some type of experience that could be shared. Uh, to me, art is like creating something that invokes an emotion in another person and that something can be anything it could be like me telling you a joke and when you hear it it makes you feel funny angry sad um or it can be me singing a song and when you hear it it creates an emotion out of you or maybe you paint a picture or someone looks at it and they feel a certain way uh artists use whatever i guess like tool their tool to invoke a feeling within another person. And I think that's what art is for me. Are you asking the balance for an artist in terms of being able to create art, but also in a way where you're not being trapped by the ego because you could absolutely create art and everyone's like, Oh my God, Steven, that was awesome. This podcast is amazing, dude. And then it becomes, uh, it becomes more of a, an ego thing than an art thing, perhaps. Like when we're talking here and we're doing, let's say we're doing this podcast. I know this is just us talking. But there's like a, there's like a creation that's happening. That's very like free flowing. It's like, we know not that many people are going to watch this. So we can speak openly. We can, we can talk openly. But like, are you, are you, and I guess I'm using this podcast as, as an example, but it could be anything. Are you suggesting that, let's say, I don't know, let's say next week for some reason we get a hundred or a thousand subscribers. And then and then we're like, oh, uh, that's a lot of people now that's watching it or a lot more than before. Now we have to have structure. Now we have to, you know, now we have to only talk about these topics because that's what those people want. Now we have to, uh, I don't know, start the podcast on time, end it on time and A, B and C and whatever. And then the art becomes... I don't know, more of an ego thing or, or, or playing towards like a certain like box of expectations that inhibits the free flowing nature of the art. Yeah. Yeah. Basically. Um, and I'm glad you brought up time because we actually have 14 minutes in our, in our self-composed, uh, time box here so i'm kind of excited by that but yeah yes and yes and right um like i think also one part of art is being able to be to be deep in your own subjective view of something so that you can extract that experience out right like it means to intimately know what an egoic interpretation or feeling of something is um, and even again, throughout this whole, uh, you know, spiritual journey for us, I still have moments where I'm like completely captured in like feeling maybe like a song or something, or like, I still, I still get rushes of, of emotion and sensation that hit me. So affect me so deeply, but they're still passed through the lens of the ego. And what's really beautiful is I'm practicing, not being too like attached, but the ego is necessary going back to that phrase, right? I think for a personal feeling component, right? That you could 
now share. And if I pull that out, that feeling, and, and I, I leave it out there extracted, and, and, and my hope is that that, that, uh, that other people who uh, interact with it, it, it can vibrate the same thing inside of them. But I'm not, but I'm like vibrating their ego, right? Like I'm not vibrating like their spirit. I'm vibrating like the cultural understanding of what that like was. Like, oh, I can relate to that. And I think it's no, um, I think it's no accident too that like some of the best artists we know are quote unquote some of the most mentally ill, troubled, tortured souls that we've had, right? Um, they've been very deep in ego, uh, all the artists that we have. Can you say, uh, can you go back to the phrase the ego is necessary and expand on that a little bit? Cause I'm, uh, I feel like that's foundational to the point you're making and, and, and you didn't lose me, but, but some clarification would help. Yeah. So you said the is, ego is necessary in relation to, to art, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. So this is going to be really, I think it's going to be a little difficult to explain because it's a deep much deeper concept about the wholeness versus the individual but so the ego is um what we've constructed right uh in order for us to interface with other people in society well it's idealistic to say that we constructed it most most of the time it's constructed by like other people and we just like take it like it's just been given to us, but anyway, but the ego allows us to essentially be human, right? Have like human, like feel like, like heartbreak, right? Like let's say um, you experience heartbreak over like a loss of um, someone in your life. You know, if you are just like Zen meditating, tapped into like the source and understand that life and death are just like, you know, this infinite perpetual cycle, there is no, like, it's great. That's where peace comes from. That's where deeper understanding comes from. But that doesn't, that's not going to be able to make me like write a song that touches like a million people on what heartbreak feels like, right? In order for me to experience, like under experience heartbreak, I'm, I have to be in ego to, you know, one, remember all the stories that I've read in my life about like, heartbreak and for me to like identify emotionally with law like 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 this loss is perceived as being actual loss right an actual wound um within what you know while being human so um i don't know maybe you can uh, take some of that material and, and <laughs> refine it it's a hard it's a hard one like you you have you can't to be both. I'm trying to think if you need to be an ego to experience like heartbreak. Is that an egoic thing? Or is it like or is it like a and, and I know we're talking on extremes here, so it makes it a little harder or maybe easier to understand, but it would be like if I don't know, if like the Dalai Lama's mom died, like is he just like, oh yeah, like. Like, does it just pass through him because he's like woke as fuck? Or like, even if he can see the egoic patterns of, of humans and within himself, even if he has awareness of the ego and he's using the ego as a tool, as opposed to the ego using him, does he still, still feel, um, you know, that pain of losing someone? And uh, that's the question that I'm not, I mean, I don't have an answer for that, obviously, because, but that's the question that I pose. You, you know what I'm trying to say, right? It's, it's like, like if the Dalai Lama's mom died, is he, is he sad? Or is he just like fully aware and he's just like, I'm just in the present moment, you know? Like, uh, the feeling just passes through him. It doesn't stick in any way, shape, or form. Maybe he gets over it faster. Yeah. Maybe, so, yeah. So, I mean, I, I don't want to mix up. I don't want to mix up, like, 
um, or maybe I should say, or I could just say, I, I want to clarify, like, to me, it's not so much about whether or not things can pass through you, right, or not, or if you're attached to them, but that, like, his, the, the Dalai Lama's understanding of pain and suffering in the human world, right, like, not as him as a Dalai Lama, but like a normal person, right, it's, it is built on him having somehow accessing that understanding, right? Whether he experienced that loss himself personally prior to being, you know, having embarked on his spiritual journey, or he just has, and it could very well be the case, because I'm very, I'm very, very interested in people like this who just have like such a high degree of empathy and EQ that they can download experiences that um, would otherwise be very like, you know, uh, foreign or, you know, how else would you get? Like, I know for me, a lot of things, like, I, I think I have a decent self-assessed empathy, but that versus things that I've, I've experienced personally in my life, it's like, you know, it's so different, right? And that, but the things that I've per personally experienced in life, I can talk about those and I can, do things with those, right? If someone is suffering in front of me, like I can kind of like, I'm, I'm equipped in a different way than if I was just intellectually trying to, you know, be the, empathize with them, understand it. Um, and so that's, so like, I think that there, there's like the degree or proficiency of like the capacity of the depth and the texture, the, you know, of the, of, the, of, of the experience and sensation um, which is different from obviously like how attached and anchored you might be to that thing. But sometimes I, I think that's what I'm getting as a double-edged sword because like sometimes because that thing is so intense, it's, it's hard for us not to just lose ourselves in it. Um, but, but so does the Dalai Lama feel that, that the depth of it, right? It, no matter what comes through, I'm sure it'll pa it passes through him. He's well-practiced, right? He comes through. He acknowledges it, says thank you. But you know, how affected is he? I forgot how we started talking about this. Uh oh. We we're talking about okay, so basically you brought up clothes, right? And like, and that's a really I actually, I'm sorry, I wish we spent more time on the, the mechanical functional things of altering your clothes and environment and the feedback loop, because it's a fun thing to diagram out. But I basically brought up like, man, uh, like, okay, how can I start to like play with clothes as an artistic expression without becoming caught up in like vanity or something, right? Or what is that? How does that like, wanted to hear maybe your thoughts on like, not just the 80, 20, but the 81, 19, right? The 82, 18, like where you're, 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 for, you're pushing it a little bit more to explore and to see, right? But you might get lost in the sauce. <laughs> like, if you start going 19, it goes down, not up. Right. But your attachment to, I mean, the effort the the, 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 what you have to push into it goes more up, right? So, so it would be 20, it would be, It'll be 21, uh, 80.2 or something. Like, oh, it, it, or okay. 20, like it, it would be like 1% one, 1 more effort, but you're getting like much less like juice from the squeeze. Oh, uh, it's just like a, it's just like a calculus asymptote where you'll never hit 100. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an asymptote. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, yeah, yeah. it's already like, once you get to the 80%, theoretically, it's like, all right, look, every ounce of effort you put in from this point on is just going to be uh diminishing returns to the point where it's infinity yeah uh and then obviously once you get to the 99 whatever you're probably putting in like 50 percent of the effort just to get just to be like that one percent better than you know the best of the best um i've never graphed it that way i love that that's that a huge that's that's cool very cool it's funny I I graph it that way because I'm lazy, but I remember the first time I, I spoke to you about it, uh, you were using it in the the corollary of the 80-20 rule, which is the last 20% always takes 80% of your effort. 
and kind of like expect that. I remember you you were telling me something like that. I don't even remember if you remember telling me that, but I was like, wait, you used it backwards, bro. <laughs> but then I was like, I was like, that's so cool because then you you start to understand what it takes to finish projects as opposed to start them. Uh, and I think seeing it from that perspective is also very useful for me. Like I literally been using 80-20 rule for like 15 years. And then I think in the last year when you mentioned it, I was like, oh, cool. Like I never thought, maybe that's why I never finished projects because <laughs> it makes sense as a corollary, but I don't know why I never. Yeah, that's interesting. I think that's really cool. I'm glad that it, like, that I was able to uh, enrich that understanding and, and vice versa. Like, you know, I think that flowed back this way too. I think that's what, that's what's really interesting is that like everything that we come across and encounter is like so multidimensional, right? Like even one simple concept that you're like, oh, 80, 20 Pareto principle. And it's like, oh, there's the inverse, the corollary, the whatever. So, yeah. It's funny about the 80, 20 viewed in that way too is that like, whenever you get to 80%, you always let off the pedal. Most like 90% of people are like, oh, oh, pat myself in the back, you got to 80, man, look at that. You only got 20% left to go. Like, it's gonna be easy. Not knowing that you still have 80% more to go in terms of effort. Oh, dude, I quit at 80%. I'm like, all right. <laughs> it's done. <laughs> I have developed an, a general understanding of this, of, of this domain time for me to move on to the next thing and got what i need yeah you're a harvester you're just an excavator of the 80 yeah i just want to i just want 80 20 everything and just maybe through that being a generalist uh, i could build something that's not buildable without knowing many different things i don't yeah. know if that makes any sense jack of all trades uh master of none you know people always cut that that phrase short though What's the ending? I feel like I've heard this before, but I've, I've definitely... it's, uh, it's still better than a master of one. Oh, okay. And so, yeah. So they, we, we, everyone uses uh, that phrase more of a, in a negative, not negative, but you know, like in a, yeah, detracting way, but really it's actually meant to be um, a bit more of a boost for those of us who aren't are, are generalists. Um, yeah um yeah i feel like some jack of all trades guy just added that ending to feel better <laughs> yeah it's like got yeah. him <laughs> you got him you don't own that phrase yeah yeah this was an interesting conversation we went we went to a lot of places um i'm still playing with the idea of visual uh the visual part of a self-construct because I, I i never I never thought of that uh or or i've never dove deep into that from my perspective and obviously talking about how i present myself and i'm probably honestly probably not going to do anything different uh knowing myself because i'm just i would 80 20 my entire wardrobe if i could which i have but what if same... uh i know that we're older now but what if you bought exclusively graphic tees that had mantras on right here i mean i could go kind, be, be kind to yourself <laughs> start i could start a clothing line and just just only wear that stuff <laughs> yeah i would wear I, I mean if the mantras say cool stuff i would i would wear that stuff i don't know how hard it'd be to get have we just planted the seed for our podcast's merch we could how hard is it to get someone to make like like, I don't know if I want to buy, like, you know, a hundred of the same shirts. But, like, can you go on Etsy and just get someone to make, like, I don't know, 10 of them? Uh, I mean, you'd pay for that limited volume, right? Um, yeah. You know. So. I wonder what the 80-20 the of limited volume shirts is. Like, how much yeah. until it's, like, 10 bucks a shirt? Do you need yeah. to buy, like, a hundred or something? I would say the 80-20 would be li probably us doing it ourselves. Uh, putting a stencil down of just letters and spray painting that joint. It's like one go, psh, 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 psh. <laughs> for like, you know, you wanted to do like 20, right? Per, per mantra. Like that's probably, cause yeah, I think everything else, I, I've made a couple t-shirts before. That's why. Um, and my gym regularly pumps out t-shirts, like custom like tees and does a run. So 
I'm sure HGH too. So yeah, it's yeah. <laughs> That's funny. In my head, I was like the 80-20 is definitely not us making these shirts doing it ourselves <laughs> but i mean yeah. if you know how to make shirts and maybe that's why it's 80 20 for you well that's why i literally said like spray paint a stencil right because uh yeah at, at a certain point yeah yeah anyway i digress yeah so visual visual construct updating damn man, visual there, could construct. Be, there could be a lot of ego there man because ego gets reinforced by how people how people like treat you in a way it's uh and visual constructs is just the way you present yourself for sure definitely deeply affects how people treat you and in in that regard um so i became egoically attached at our ceremony actually on this topic of visual constructs because what's really funny now that i've tried to do this like ego dance game is like to not appear as if I have ego. I got attached to not having ego, right? And, but while still like wanting to present a certain way, but like, that was like personally decided. Um, it is really interesting and one that we should park, but it's like everything you do. I don't know, everything that you have. What if you just started wearing like something ridiculous? <laughs> like, like every day you have to wear I don't know. Let's say 50% of your wardrobe has to be purple, you know, or something stupid. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> or, you, or you always, you always have to have a hat on and it has to be not a beanie. Like, you know, like, I mean, I, I've gone many months wearing beanies. It's about the beanie season, but what if it was just like, you have to wear like a crazy hat, you know? <laughs> so I, I think this is actually really interesting. Um, because if I had to personally self-assess my style, like I more or less am in the mainstream, but there's like certain things that like stick out to let people know that I'm still a wild card, right? And don't box me in and like, I'm hey, by the way, if I go off to my random thing, like you, you should automatically assume that it fits with my brand, right? I thought the tattoo sleep was a big part of it too, you know? Um, what's really great is that tattoos are not as stigmatized as they used to be. So it's not as much of a statement as it would have been uh, prior. But I do think like, maybe tattoo is the next way you do this, man. Maybe if you don't make a change in, uh, in your wardrobe, uh, and I know that you've been interested in tattoos, like the location of your tattoo is also a big part of the visual construct, right? Both to yourself and to other people. Like I knew that there's certain tattoos I needed on my forearms, like pointed at me or things that I would see in the mirror. Like, like there's one here, I only see if, uh, you know, my shirt is off, I'm in the mirror, it's just me, no one else or whatever. And there's also one on the back of my back shoulder that I don't see often at all, except for like, you know, if someone takes a picture of me and I'm doing boxing or, or I'm at the beach. And it's, anyway, uh, that was an interesting thought that you just uh, gave to me. But I think there's a functional value in, in, in like always riding that line and, and communicating to people that like, Hey, I'm with you. I'm part of the same team with you. Like I'm predictable. You can expect probably the same thing, but there's an element of, of which like is autonomous and personal to me that like I reserve to do whatever I want with it. Right. And that communication, I think allows for a lot of interplay and freedom in the, in the roles that you manifest through life. I know certainly at my job, um, I don't ever want to be boxed in, right? Like I want to be able to go randomly run off and do my own project for like two weeks, and not, not have anyone like micromanage me. And I think it's because of small little things that I communicate to people um, non-verbally. So it can, there's a lot of utility there. Yeah. No, for sure. I mean, ego is a very interesting tool uh, and being aware of it and learning how to use it without getting trapped by it is damn, that's a game that we're always going to have to play. But then even being like, hey, I understand that the ego is a tool and I'm trying to play this game. It's it's also uh, can be very egoic. Damn, I should get a tattoo. Oh, um, uh, so, all right. Uh, this is a side tangent, but maybe not necessarily. I don't know. Personal experience from this, this weekend. Um, so our good friend Min, 
uh, she she brought me a a sash for my birthday that says uh, birthday king or something on it, and and also a tiara and like you know like one of those like um, I guess like little like princess things you wear on your head on your head. That so is she, a tiara. That yeah, is a tiara. yeah, yeah. And she and she was like, yo. So she messaged me before, and she was like, yo, I need you to wear this um, at Echo around for your birthday because it's your birthday. And I I hate drawing attention to myself. I literally, I'm like, I literally hate drawing attention to myself. I barely even want people to know it's my birthday. Uh, the, but I would, I would tell everyone it's my birthday if it got them to go to Alan Walker. Because, you know, obviously we... Um, I knew it was going to be a good time, especially if everyone was there. And I'm down to tell everyone it's my birthday if they go to Alan Walker. But as soon as they're committed to Alan Walker, then it's no longer my birthday. It's just, yo, you're coming, right? Um, and, and it was an amazing birthday. But then, but then when we got to Echo, uh, Min brought, bought, like, brought out the sash and like the tiara. And she was like, all right, time for you to wear this. And I was like, look, dude, I already told you I'm not wearing that. And I'm not wearing that. And she was like so perplexed as to why I wouldn't put it on. And, and it was like almost like this, uh, this line I didn't want to cross. I was like, look, that's gonna, that thing is going to draw more attention to me than I wanted to. So I do not want to wear that. And so I'm good. I really appreciate the fact that you got me in the sash, but I'm not wearing it because, I mean, I didn't really explain it to her as to why I'm not wearing it. I'm just like, I'm not wearing that damn sash. <laughs> and 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 you know and, and thinking back on that I was like oh, I wonder why I was so against wearing that sash but I, I think it's because I don't know that's part of the visual construct it's part of the uh it's part of how you know this thing gets portrayed in, into the world and and on a personal level I I don't like attention and that thing is literally just like hey guys look at me uh in my opinion at least I don't know if that's I I, I don't think uh, that's what Min was trying to do I think I think she was like doing it all out of like love and stuff like that uh then later in the night Mimi was like hey man you should probably wear that sash dude she she probably she probably put a lot of thought into that to you know bring it out here and I was like damn I guess I'm kind of a dick but you know at this point it's too late you know <laughs> I'm already uh, I'm already committed uh but I was just thinking about that when we we're talking about like visual constructs like you know um but yeah it's kind of an interesting uh I don't want to wear a sash bro <laughs> But it was it was out of love, uh, so I appreciate the fact that Min thought about me and got me a a birthday king sash, even though I didn't want to wear it. Oh, that was a great one. That was a great one. Um, so quick time check. I think we should probably wrap uh, on that note. I think that was a really great one, though. Um, I'll come out and confess that like I did talk to her beforehand about it. I think she already had plans to do the sash. So don't get me wrong. Like, I think that was already her thing. Yeah, she she messaged me on Facebook like yeah. a day or a couple of days before. And I was like, yo, thank you so much, but don't bring that sash. I'm not wearing it. And then she okay. brought it and I was like, I'm not wearing that shit. So I was chatting with her about it. And I was like, yeah, who? Oh, yeah, let's let's go all in. Like, he's going to wear it. He dressed up as Mimi for Halloween. And she was like, no way. I was like, yeah, he dressed up as Mimi for Halloween. But that was <laughs> Halloween. Every Everyone was in costume. Um, and so we were, we were optimistic uh, that the... Uh, you know, but I think that's a funny one. Uh, we don't talk about, shouldn't talk about this now, but um, God, that's a really interesting one. Let's park that one. Like I, I was thinking of it as all the ways, all the different environments in the past where that feeling has come up, the feeling that you just kind of described. What's that feeling? Of, of just not wanting to like, you know, quote unquote seem like stupid or silly or draw attention or any of that stuff right that that thing is interesting like I remember actually back in college where, where uh, me and the gang our college roommates were first getting to snowboarding and we're trying to equip ourselves and we're just like all black but then that we saw all of this gear that was on sale but it was like colorful and it like only we're like man only good people wear that we can't wear that like we're gonna look like like you know <laughs> But then we start to get better and the deal started to get like sweeter. Like, oh my God, like that's the top of the line jacket, but it's like, has this like funky pattern. And then, you know, we started to get confidence from each other. Like, oh shit, did you just buy that, those gloves? Oh, okay, fine. All right, I'm going to go for those pants. Like, um, 
but we again because we didn't want to seem uh like you know, not to like, stand we, out. Like we were like, yeah, like we were peacocking or putting on, yeah. You know, you know that's stand out. But I mean when, that's over with now. When I go shopping for clothes, I do buy relatively muted like colors, like like dark blues, like grays, blacks. Uh, my whole wardrobe is just that. So I mean, I, I think in general, I'm just like, yo, I just want to be in the background. But we we should talk about that in a future pod just because. And some people are the opposite. Some people, you know, just, just like loud, you know, they just want to be loud. And <laughs> yeah. And I think that's an interesting topic we could definitely dive into. Uh, but let's, let's wrap it up on this one. I don't know if you have any closing thoughts, but I'm going to, no. I'm going to, I'm going to put that oh, in the parking I'll, lot. I'll close, I'll close on one thing, one thing. Uh, so a friend um, reminded me on the topic of the podcast of, uh, Hank Green, and I think his brother's name is John, really famous YouTubers and authors. And I just wanted to say that I thought this was just a really important frame for the, the future of this podcast and what we're doing now, even though it's messy. And like, I'm, I've almost like, when we started this podcast, felt like a little bit, ah, uh, podcast, constructive podcast. And then we we're, and we kept reassuring ourselves, no, 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 no. And, but the reassurance would be a little bit like hollow, but Looking back at the example that uh, John and Hank, the Green Brothers did, I think really inspired me to keep going and, and letting it unfold as it will. And for, so by the way, the reason why I bring this up is because they got famous because they literally told themselves, they lived apart and they would try to catch up and they told themselves, um, we can only communicate by sending videos to each other on YouTube. Like we can't use phone, we can't use email, we can't use anything. We just have to like talk through like, video messages and it and it just kept doing and it became this like amazing thing but it started very much like this like like what we're doing here so anyway i wanted to close on that note uh, and uh let's see how it goes maybe we yeah. spend another podcast talking about that but yeah i think uh man this podcast this podcast would get really weird if we ever get got to like a hundred subscribers <laughs> dude a hundred i don't even want to think about it that's uh, so that cracks me up the fact that you like i felt that when you said a hundred i was like oh my god yeah you know, a hundred would be a lot uh but yeah let's <laughs> let's let's close on that i'm, I'm nervous Great. all right let me uh stop recording <laughs>